Welcome back to Making the Argument. As you can see, I am not in the studio today, and that is because I am down in Richmond. But that is not going to prevent us from continuing to put out quality episodes for you. And today, we've got an interesting one. We're going to talk about what happens if the right goes bad, right? Is that something that could, is that something that's even possible? I mean, after all, if, if we are people on the right in the conservative movement within the United States that believes in concepts like objective morality and objective truth and reason and logic, then we have to actually come to grips with the fact that, yes, it is, it is absolutely possible that the right could also go bad. What exactly does that look like and what causes it? Well, today we're going to go over kind of three categories, which I have dubbed the lazy, the crazy, and the ugly. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that have been happening within the right, specifically in the United States, but you could also extrapolate this out to other parts of the world as well. We're going to talk about some of the problems that we see coming up. We're going to talk about why some of those things are taking place. And most importantly, we're going to talk about how we avoid it and make sure that we actually stay true to the values that we care about. All of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument, powered by Good Ranchers. Thank you so much for joining us as producer Hamilton. You may or may not see my video, but if you don't, that's all right. We've got everybody here in the studio. We've got some new processes that we're working out and systems and whatnot. But if you haven't already, we would love to get to know you in our community chat, which you can join by going down to the link in the description. And again, thanks for joining us. All right, as always, I am your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates, and I'm proving that by about, because we're about to go into legislative session here, and that's why I'm in Richmond. With us, as always, my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees. Hello, everyone. And then, of course, we have Master Hines. That's right, a resident historian and political prognosticator. Hey, Christian. I have been looking forward to this episode ever since we recorded our right wing backlash episode last spring. So the circumstances yeah, this one, are this one's definitely going definitely going to be interesting. And then, yeah. of course, we have our producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. That's right. All right, let's go ahead and get to it. Um, so let's, let's start off kind of by defining our terms here, because one of the things that I've recognized a lot when I've debated these issues with respect to what constitutes conservatism, a lot of times there's this European component and then there's the American component. And sometimes there's no distinction made zero, no distinction made. And I've gotten into these arguments before with college professors and whatnot, because when you talk about conservatism, there are certain, what I would call unifying threads. So some of that could be uh, that conservatives in general have a respect for institutions, have a respect for tradition. And those institutions are not just government institutions. They could be the church, the family, things of that nature. Um, there's also a general respect for authority, this, this concept of honor and loyalty and patriotism. These things are, are kind of universally associated with conservatism in general. And that also manifests itself in other things that we might consider a little bit more uh, cultural with, with respect to things like um, traditional gender roles or uh, modesty in one's dress or professionalism or things like that. No matter where you go, you would probably find some continuity among people identifying as conservatives expressing some sort of commitment to those ideas. What makes I would argue American conservatism um, a little bit different, and you could you could see this manifested in other countries as well. Is when you talk about the type of institutions or the type of philosophies or the type of ideas, obviously there's going to be some difference with respect to these specifics. So, for instance, conservatism within much of Western Europe used to be comprised of monarchists, right? It was comprised of maybe uh, uh, state-sponsored religion. There, there was all sorts of things. Um, along those lines that you wouldn't find in the American brand of conservatism, in part because the American Revolution in large part was rejection of monarchy. Uh, but in addition to that, it was also founded on certain principles. And I think if you look at Margaret Thatcher, she had a quote, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it was something along the lines of Europe was created by history, America was created by philosophy. And that is an important distinction because uh, American conservatism has generally been rooted in not only the traditional concepts of conservatism that I already mentioned, but also in this idea of uh, individual liberty, uh, that your rights come from God, that government should be limited, that government should be um, derived from the, the people and from the electorate, things like uh, property rights, 
uh, generally speaking, free market economics, like all of these things have been kind of woven into the uh, the greater American identity. And therefore, American conservatives have generally speaking associated themselves with these philosophical concepts, whereas more left leaning ideologies, uh, especially recently, um, associate themselves more with everything from uh, Marxism to democratic socialism to critical theory, a lot of other concepts which you, you could never say were inherent with respect to the American founding. And that's why you generally see this, this conflict behind conservatives and specifically American conservatives and the modern American left, right? And so I wanted to throw that out there to kind of define our terms a little bit so that when we talk about conservatism, we're not confusing it with different European branches of conservatism or even uh, branches that you might see in other parts of the world as well that don't properly connect to American conservatism and, and everything that that has meant. Um, but the, reason, the other reason why I bring that out is because some of those commitments that have generally been associated with the conservative movement are starting to lose their grip in certain wings of what is considered the conservative movement. And that really begs the question, like, okay, is it conservative then? Is it, is it just right wing or is it conservative in the American tradition? And so the first thing that we're going to talk about, that first category that I laid out that we're going to discuss is that idea of the laziness, right? So when we look at the ways that conservatism can go ugly, that, that right-wing politics or right-wing ideology in the American tradition, where it can go ugly, the thing we're going to start with is talking about what I think is a, has become a major problem, and that's kind of the overall laziness uh, that I think has been manifest within conservative circles and conservative thought for quite some time. And to clarify what I mean by that, I don't mean that if you're a conservative, you're lazy. I don't mean that conservatives in general are lazy. And in fact, I think one of the things that conservatives do pride themselves on is this idea of uh, independence, self-reliance, uh, work ethic. Those are all considered conservative principles. But there is this natural trend, and I'll, I'll provide one perfect example of this, and that's the church. Whenever an, whenever an institution, whenever a group of people become, let's say, confident and comfortable that their overall philosophy has become so dominant within the culture that it's essentially unassailable, that, that it's a, a kind of a given that everyone believes this way. What ends up happening over time is there can be little incursions that are made. There can be little departures from the truth or from the idea that can be made. And all of a sudden, because people aren't ready and intellectually capable of being able to defend it or even recognize sometimes that it's happening, they let it go. Um, and when they're finally confronted with it, it's either a whole lot stronger than they actually thought it was, or they're completely ill-equipped to be able to present a good, reasonable, rational argument for it because it never occurred to them that they would have to. Doesn't everybody already believe this? And this is something that I want to get, you know, Christian and Tina's take from, but I think that we have to lay, um, as we look at some of the offshoots and some of the things that are happening with the conservative movement that I know that I'm not very happy about and what I would kind of deem starting to move in that kind of right-wing authoritarian direction, um, I have to lay a lot of the blame to some degree initially at this idea of just intellectual laziness within the conservative movement of this idea of, yeah, I'm conservative. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means I love my country or God, family and country. Okay. But why, what, why do you believe in those things? Which God, why do you believe in that God? What about when your God did this? What, what about when God, and they don't have an answer. Well, okay. You say you believe in your country, but what about when your country did this? Oh, well, no, that's my government. I love my country. Okay. Well, give me the distinction. What are you talking about? Okay, you love family. Oh, so family is this narrow definition of your family. What about this family over here? Do you not love that family? Is it only you? And all of a sudden, you have you have people that don't know how to defend this. And so what they do is they they kind of insulate themselves in within a smaller group that kind of is like minded, but they don't have any capacity for defending it. So, I mean, Christian, you you just I mean finished up your master's degree, um, and obviously being in a college environment, we've we've both been in one. You you've been in it longer than I have. Um, did you did you find many people within a college environment where whenever conversations would come up, um, say discussing conservative philosophy, how many people would you say in your class um, or, or in one of your classes, just an example, were conservative but were just completely quiet about it? Um, not a lot. Probably generously 15 to 20%. 
So 15 um, or 20% it, were conservative, but would they talk about it? Would they be willing to actually engage in no, debate? No, no. The, the, the number of people that would engage in debate is zero. 1% if you really? kill me. And, and even sometimes I would just you know, be like, well, it's, it's just not worth it every time that something happens to, to have a debate. Sometimes you just want to get through whatever the lecture is or the course is. or like, like if you're in an art history class, this was when I was getting my undergrad. If you're in an art history class and the professor's going off about how, you know, terrible guns are and we need confiscation in the United States, you're sitting there and you're just like, okay, who, who cares what this guy has to say about this one topic? Let me just get through this class and then go to lunch, right? And so you're just not going to pick a fight on it, – it's stuff well, like and, that. And it's, it, it's to well, be expected. But I can, I, can under, I can understand the – I can understand the – this isn't worth my time, right? Because not every argument is worth your time. Not every conflict is worth your time. But by the same token, if every professor, or not say every professor, but let's say every time um, politics is inserting itself into a class, maybe especially a class where you wouldn't necessarily expect it to, the, the, the discussion is always, I'm not going to do this because it's not worth my time. How many students would you say are, are saying, I'm not going to do this because there are academic or social consequences if I do. Well, it's it's tied into that. So part of the reason it's not worth your time, part of it is just because, again, you, you just don't care to have the fight. But another reason why is, are you really going to pick a fight with some, you know, professor teaching, you know, one of the required, you know, general required courses and then create this big blow up that you then have to deal with over the course of ensuing days or weeks within the administrative system just to pick up, you know, j just to push back about, you know, why we shouldn't have mass confiscation of firearms for, for the 20 percent of the class that are conservative. It, it from their point of view, it's it's just not worth it. There is not enough payoff there. And so they stay silent. I mean, in, in the opinion polling on this is very clear that like conservatives, anybody on the right or center right in universities are the ones who report the highest degree of, of self-censorship. And I'm not going to pretend that I wasn't one of those people. This was a long time ago when I was getting my, not that long ago, but you know, it was, it was eight to 10 years ago when I was getting my bachelor's and you know, I was a lot younger at the time and a lot less sure. This was around the time that I was starting to get to know you and, you know, mm -hmm. you know, pushing you to run for office. Right. And I was just a lot less sure of myself when you're a 20 something, you know, when you're a 20 year old. You haven't necessarily, most 20 year olds have not necessarily constructed a really deep philosophy where they can just debate anybody at any moment on any subject about anything related to conservatism or the role of government or why you need to preserve some of these institutions like the church or the family or, or you know what I mean? They, they just haven't well, necessarily well, but, formed into that philosophy, well, even if they might second. believe in it. Well, okay. But let me, let me say this. Okay. So now let's reverse it. If a, and I don't know if you ever witnessed this, I didn't personally because I just didn't, I didn't, it either didn't come up or conservative professors didn't, you know, uh, incorporate their, their political beliefs the same way that my, my left, my, my left wing professors did. But if a conservative professor brought something up, made some sort of statement that no, ab absolutely not. We shouldn't be confiscating guns. In fact, it would be better if, if more private citizens were actually responsible gun owners. How many left wing students do you think would have stood up and had issue with that? That only happened once. I, I literally in in the three and a half years because I graduated early. In the three and a half years that I got my undergrad, that happened once where I had a conservative or even center right professor, and and this was a professor that like supported Mitt Romney, so not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. You know, this was <laughs> yeah. in 2012, right? So, so you know, not necessarily, you know, the most conservative person in the world, right? And and I think that actually kind of speaks to the degree of ideological capture that you see within academia, because out of all of the professors that I had and all the years that I was getting my undergrad, I had one that I know was quote unquote on the on the right or at least the center right. And yeah, but even but then they didn't I guess my, necessarily bring up a lot of stuff that, that would lead to yeah. pushback because it wasn't just the students that would censor. It would be the faculty that would also censor if they weren't on the far left or, or, you know, left winged in, in varying degrees. Well, so it works see, this, both this ways. Is my, this is kind of, this is the point I'm getting at. The point I'm getting at is that if a, if a right wing, so if, if the statement is, Hey, look, when you're 20 years old, you probably haven't formulated a very complex worldview. You're still figuring things out. You're still asking questions or whatnot. I would be fine with that, except that that doesn't seem to play in both directions. 
it, it seems that the, the, let's say the students that go into college that are a little bit more conservative are, are also a little bit more leery of sharing their opinion or engaging with a professor or an authority figure, whereas a student on the left is, is not only a, not afraid to get up and tell the professor that they think they're wrong, but then to go to the administration and complain about the professor and then organize their friends in a protest against the professor and then you know disinvite somebody from speaking. That, that's my point, is that it would be one thing if this was just a generalized idea of, hey, what people, kids are young, they don't know what they're figuring out. That's why they're at college. They're trying to figure this stuff out. But I don't see that manifesting itself in that way. I mean, so I, I don't really know what to say. Like intolerance works. Bullying works. Not necessarily for, for the right reasons, but like the intolerant minority became the intolerant plurality, became the intolerant majority, became the intolerant supermajority. Well, I, I, I don't know who coined this phrase, but somebody came up with, I, with, with a phrase that the side that wants to win will always defeat the side that wants to be left alone. And I think there's there's truth to that when you look within academia, but I also think that it applies outside of academia. Look at what has happened. It's not just academia that the left captured. They also captured the media. They also captured Silicon Valley and Wall Street. They also captured the entertainment industry. It, we've done multiple episodes talking about many of these separate institutions and, and all of them falling to the left one by one by one. And, and you could argue that it started within academia and the media and it spread out from there. And the most recent ones that they captured were the financial institutions and the tech sector and stuff like that. The ones that are fueled by capitalism, which we inherently would have an advantage within, but now we've been yeah. excluded from even those. And I think the reason why is because of that that quote that I just read you. Well, I, I think it's also the, the the I think the left also did a very good job of recognizing the power of things like HR departments. Um, so so the, the conservative idea is is that if you're going to go into an academic setting or if you're going to have a debate about, about a particular topic, then the idea would be is that people get to come, you know, we, we permit diverse ideas to be able to come around or diverse perspectives to be able to come around and debate a particular you know, concept or idea. And the whole concept of freedom of speech and freedom of inquiry is, is rooted in, in that, you know, that, that, that notion. What it seems to me, though, is that the, the more people from the left that were allowed into the university system, the more they then attempted to capture more and more of the departments, more and more of the the key positions, and not just key positions within like the humanities, but also the the key positions within the administration. So so now they're they're basically in a, in a greater position of power to gatekeep who can even come into the institution. And like you said, that's not just academia. Um, there, there was this one HR rep that when the whole Canadian trucker strike was going on, she got on there and very arrogantly, you know, pronounced to the world that, you know, Hey, I'm an HR rep and guess what? We all talk to each other and guess what? We hate you. And so you, if we see this stuff on your social media, you're never good luck getting a job. Now she ended up getting fired for that. Not because I don't, not because I don't think she was accurately depicting what goes on in a lot of areas, but because you're not supposed to say the quiet part out loud before you have achieved complete capture, right? That that's always that's always one of the problems, and that's something that we're going to talk about a little later with the whole idea of um, action and reaction. But I, I think what's interesting is, and, and I see this sometimes with I'll I'll talk with parents, and parents will ask me, you know, what again? Why did my kid go off to college, or why did my kid go off to school, and why don't they, you know, why don't they believe the things that we taught them? And you know, I'll always ask the question on okay. What, what did those conversations look like with your child when discussing um, either your faith or your political philosophy or principles? You know, what, what did that look like? And, and again, I think a lot of parents somewhat feel betrayed. And, and let's, let's be, I don't, I don't want to be too hard on these parents. To some degree, rightfully so. They were betrayed. They thought they were sending their kids off to, they thought they were doing the right thing as parents. They, they provided their kids protection. They provided them, you know, a, a, a raise, reasonably safe and, and affluent uh, area to, to grow up in. And they conveyed certain values to them. And they took it for granted that not only were their kids making the connection between their values and the safety and the prosperity that they were experiencing, but that those same concepts were being also relayed and supported within their school system. And more and more, they're starting to realize that, oh my gosh, this is, my values are not reflected in the school system. In fact, it's not even that the school system are neutral to my ideas. In many cases, they're openly hostile. 
And, and whenever, again, whenever I say something like that, I always get people calling my office, telling, how dare I? And I'm like, I, I don't care. Don't, don't vote for me. Like, I don't know what to tell you. This is going on and I'm not going to pretend like it isn't well, because I can look. Go ahead. Yeah. This, I was just going to say, this is not something new either. I mean, we grew up in a, a relatively, um, it's a bigger town now, but it was, wasn't very big when we were growing up. And my junior high, I remember so many far left wing teachers who would constantly push their agenda in junior high. It was seventh grade, eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was wild to me that even back then, and I mean, just to give you an idea, that would have been three decades ago, three decades ago. And yeah. you think, and so there's all these folks that think, oh, well, we live in a small town. It's really not too bad here. That's not true. Not true at all. In fact, some of the smaller places are being targeted by, by these more leftist um, people. And they do it these really sneaky, sneaky little ways. Like this is an underserved area and mm -hmm. we'll pay you some more if you'll go over to this underserved area and, you know, we'll do this. We'll forgive your college debt. We'll do all kinds of stuff for you in order to get you to this underserved area. And so then you've got people from the cities that are typically a lot more left wing coming over to teach in a, in a town they're not from. And um, it's I look at some of this and I go, look at the power structure dynamic here. You've got the left. I mean, even Christians sitting here going, I didn't want to pick a fight with my professor. Well, actually, your art professor picked a fight with you. He picked a f this person who's supposed to be teaching art, decided to go art out history. of their way, art history, out of their way to talk about guns for some reason. And um, just almost like a dare, like I dare anybody to stand up to what I'm saying. And then not only that, it also feeds into um, what everybody else is pushing for these other students to try to really solidify them into their activist camp. And so, I mean, I've, I've gotten to the point where, I mean, <sighs> academia, you're just immersing your kid into a leftist ideology um, on the hopes that they'll be financially successful. And, and they come out, they can't find a freaking job. They've got a hundred grand in student loan debt. And oh, by the way, they hate you now and they hate your God and they hate your politics. Uh, speaking of that, Tina, and, and there, there's a second side of this, the lazy component that, that we're talking about in the first like third or so of this episode that, that I wanted to, to kind of posit to both you and Nick is that it's not just that conservatives got lazy because they thought they had won. Nick said near the beginning of the show that, you know, and, and you've told me before in, in entirely separate conversations that you remember like when the Berlin Wall fell down and the Soviet Union mm -hmm. disintegrated. And, and, and it was this idea that like this is a momentous event. We won. Marxism lost. And we've also done episodes where we've cited like college professors speaking at the time of the disintegration of the Warsaw Pact in the Eastern Bloc saying things like, oh, I hope this happens because this will actually be beneficial to Marxism and socialism. Now that we don't have to answer for the horrible record of these regimes, we get to just teach the theory again. And we're not yeah. going to teach it in the in the classical Marxist sense about class warfare and seizing the means of production. We're going to teach it in the cultural sense. And this is how you get things like DEI and, and again, the whole emergence of things like cultural Marxism, which they bragged about until we started pointing it out. And now it's labeled as a conspiracy theory. It exists. Mm -hmm. You can go watch people like, like James Lindsay, who, who talk about it at length. It does exist, but I don't think that the problem is just that we fell asleep at the wheel and the left managed to secretly get their way into the university system and into the media. And from there it, it, it spread outwards. I also think that there's, a problem of of conservatives themselves look at the type of conservatives that were produced post fall of berlin wall post collapse of the soviet union the emergence of of, of things like neoconservatism the neocons the compassionate mm -hmm. conservatives look quite frankly yeah. look at the jeb bush mitt romney john mccain george bush wing of the party that emerged within the United States. And likewise, you can you can look in the United Kingdom, look at the David Cameron, Rishi Sunak wing of the conservative mm -hmm. party, look at the Stephen Harper wing of the conservative party in Canada. I, I, th there's multiple examples of this. Angela Merkel was not an SPD person. She was not a social Democrat. 
She came from the Christian Democratic yeah. Union, which is the center right party in Germany. And so there's yeah. there's multiple and I could keep going. Right. There's multiple examples of these figures that emerged within politics post collapse of the Soviet Union that were ostensibly on the right. And look at what they did. And mm. in, in many ways, they're responsible for what's currently going on with the crisis. Here's an example. When the left takes power. How much money do they do they take from their constituents, their loyal followers, and funnel it towards us? Yeah, Whereas never. when the right takes power, when have we ever questioned sending dollars to the university system that is teaching Americans to hate the United States, hate hate your parents, hate everything that that, that has made this this country great? We're we're funding the opposition. Well, that, that goes back to, I mean, because we see conservatives in like the General Assembly and in the legislature all the time, people that quote unquote won, they won their uh, uh, primary as if they're this great conservative. And then they turn around and they funnel money to these organizations. And it just goes to show you that they fundamentally don't know what they are supposed to believe anymore because they're not, that's not fiscally conservative. It's not a function of government to be up propping up private institutions or even, um, you know, it, it's just not a function of government. And they have this idea like, oh, we'll we'll send money over there uh, so they can, you know, build more, you know, of this posh stuff for these kids to have the college experience. And, and then they'll be happy with us and then they won't hate us so much. And that never happens. They absolutely hate you, but they want your money. Well, I think it's I think it's important to point out that. And, and to that point, and to Christian's point, especially when we talk about neoconservatism and what we might call big government conservatism, or, or, or I, I don't even want to call it conservatism, it's more big government republicanism. I mean, that's always existed. Um, I mean, we, we, can't, we can't deny the fact that in the earliest you know, days of the Republican Party, there was a lot of things that they stood for that would fly in the face of free market economics or uh, even aspects of due process of law. And, and you could argue that, it, you know, in the Civil War, the argument was as well, we were dealing with a particular crisis and it was it was significant and, and you know, potentially existential. It was like, okay, um, but that also doesn't negate the fact that there was there were certain things done during there at that time that were considered completely unconstitutional. And then it did set certain trends for things. So I, I one, one thing I do want to make a distinction here is that concept of, you know, just big government republicanism versus conservatism, because... I, I do think that over time what happened, and you you saw I think there was various departures um, for what we might call the right. And I, I think you saw departures with the Teddy Roosevelt administration, who was a Republican, but definitely what they would consider a progressive and, and very much about using the power of the federal government to intervene both internationally and domestically. Um, you saw people like Herbert Hoover, who absolutely was one of the biggest interventionists into the economy um, of, of any president in, in U.S. history. Up to that point, he was uh, arguably the largest interventionist. Uh, you, you could argue maybe Wilson was more, um, but, I mean, huge interventionist. And, and part of this really streams from this idea where I think we, we came up with this idea of, you know, again, big government republicanism and the way that it maintained the way that it maintained some sort of connection to conservatism was that it was patriotic. You know, so, okay, well, we're going to, quote, protect American businesses by raising a bunch of tariffs, or we're going to protect American jobs by, um, you know, taxing more and then subsidizing businesses, or we're going to protect, you know, whatever it was through more government agencies and intervention and power, and, and specifically, we're going to do it at the federal level. And, and Republicans don't get off the hook with, with being a part of this process. Um, and in many cases, you know, highly detrimental. I mean, Richard Nixon, uh, or Herbert Hoover, Richard Nixon, uh, and, and others were just horrible when, when it came to a lot of this. George W. Bush. Um, so I, I think we need to understand that there is a difference between, um, you know, the Republicans are considered the conservative party or, or the, the center right party or whatever it is. But Again, if we're properly defining conservatism, and this is where I think some of the laziness comes in, right, is that you have Republican politicians that will say the right things and they will say patriotic things and they will give some degree of deference to the Constitution. Uh, but like Tina pointed earlier, when you see a Republican say, you know, I support the Second Amendment because I'm an avid hunter. Well, that just tells me right off that that's lazy. 
Uh, that's either lazy or it's calculated, and either one is unacceptable. If it's if it's lazy, what it tells me is you don't actually understand why the Second Amendment exists, or here in Virginia, you don't understand why Article One, Section Thirteen exists. Right? You you don't understand that it wasn't about you being able to hunt. That there there was a deeper purpose behind this, and, or when you say, "Well, we want this massive government subsidy to set up a stadium, or we want this massive government subsidy to help this quote American business or whatever it is," that tells me once again, okay, you don't understand the danger of using the government as the apparatus to prop up a particular business or industry right. at the expense of all the taxpayers you stole from in order to do it, or the expense of of their competition within the marketplace. Right, you're, you're allowing centralized power to be perverted and used to the benefit of a very unique constituency at the expense of everyone else. And that is inherently, in my opinion, anti-conservative within the American political tradition, right. or at like least it should public, be. Like the public-private partnerships and things like that, that um, Republicans will push or, you know, it does, it does seem like <laughs> um, there are sections of, of the conservative sphere, I guess you would say, or the right, where as long as they are benefiting from whatever subsidy this mm -hmm. is or whatever this is, as long as they're the winner in this little game that's being played with this cronyism and stuff, um, they're okay with it as long as their pockets are getting lined. Um, but I do think that we're, we're really starting to see this difference now because, you know, the Republicans, uh, conservatives, we've always really been known for being really law and order, um, very, very pro-police and the whole thing. But then uh, you see things like uh, COVID happen and all of a sudden it's like they all start getting back to their roots, right? And they're going, wait a minute, I don't trust these people who are ro raiding these areas in order to clear out all these people because they're not shut down all the way or whatever. And so yeah. I do think that like we start to see this whole, okay, well, the authority says, and we're going to follow what the authority says. Um, and then, and then this sort of breakaway where you got some of these folks that are, uh, not going with it anymore. Well, and I, and I think to go to kind of move into our next section, right? So when I talk about laziness on the conservative side and what it breeds, I, th I think, again, I think the conditions which helped cause the laziness was a combination of the, the, the defeat of the Soviet Union, what was kind of perceived as the overall defeat of communism in favor of what we would call like a American uh, freedom or, or Western democracy or whatever they want to call it, right? I, I realize we're a constitutional republic, right? But um, I think that was one side of it, the idea that it was just when the Berlin Wall fell and we really got to see the inside of the Soviet Union, there was this idea that, ah, see, we've proven it once and for all. It was even worse than we imagined. And look at all the people that are now you know, fleeing to come to the West and, and, and whatnot. So part of it was, I, I think, a belief in this overall dominance. Some of it was also uh, this idea that it, it was the hijacking of, of conservative in, in many parts by certain Republicans that didn't actually believe in, in conservative ideals of constitutionally limited government, separation of powers, um, r restricting the, the ability of the government to be able to interfere within the marketplace, um, you know, foreign interventions, all of those things, right? Because they were done by Republicans, they, they now, they were co-opted um, into a conservative view. And a lot of people thought, well, this is my team and my team is now doing this. And, and, I, and I've fallen, tra I remember falling trapped to that, um, especially when I was younger, this idea of, well, I got to defend this because our side is, is doing this and there must be good reasons for it. And I want to be a good patriot. And it's like, well, wait a second, proper patriotism is actually standing up for what you believe the truth to be. But if you're comfortable and you're convinced that, you know, the, the ideas that you espouse, the ideas that you believe in are so culturally dominant that they don't require defense, you tend to be lazy and it provides the best opportunity to one, find yourself in a position where you can no longer effectively defend what it is that you believe because you don't really know anymore. You haven't actually made the, you haven't actually made the connection between individual policy positions and the underlying principles and the underlying philosophy, which is supposed to inform them. And two, it allows for the policies to now be hijacked or perverted. And again, you don't have any really association because that connection to the foundation is no longer there. And, and that laziness, um, Ultimately, and again, I'm, I want to be careful. I'm not calling every conservative that doesn't, you know, read Bosti out on a daily basis lazy. I'm just saying that there, there's maybe complacency is a better word for it. 
there's this idea that I've become comfortable that my belief systems aren't really challenged. And so I don't take the time anymore to try to rigorously understand them and to be able to formulate a defense for them. And that leaves you in a vulnerable and weak position. And if you, and if you don't want to be in a vulnerable and weak position, then what you need is protein. That's right. Protein and good ranchers is there to make sure that you have the best protein you can possibly get from a great American company supporting great American ranchers, right? That's right. And right now they have a deal all through January. All right. You go on and you go to goodranchers.com. You use promo code Nick. You sign up for one of the subscriptions and guess what you're going to get? You're going to get an order of chicken with every single delivery for the first year of that subscription. That's like, that's like 180 something dollar value, right? For free. You just get it. Because of two things. One, they want to make sure that you have all the protein you need to be big, strong, and to be able to fight for the things that you believe. Plus, they just want to prove. They want to prove once and for all that when you allow good ranchers out there doing their job, right? Do, doing their job. Not a bunch of government interference. Not a bunch of you know, government you know, pulling the strings everywhere. Just let people do what they're good at. They produce a superior product which can win in the marketplaces. Goodranchers.com. Promo code Nick. Sign up for one of the subscriptions. You're going to get like a year of free chicken added to every single order. I mean, you cannot beat that. Goodranchers.com. Again, if you're looking for a way to support the show, a great way to do it is go to goodranchers.com. Use a promo code Nick. Support yourself. Get good quality American-raised beef, pork, poultry, and wild-caught seafood. And again, we thank them for sponsoring this show. Okay. And now we're going to lead hey, into the... Can, um, that was a pretty can, good ad transition. Can can I bring <laughs> something up? I know that we're, we're about to move on to the other uh, next section. However, there is a segment of the lazy that I don't think we addressed. And that is the folks that um, they believe that it's all somebody else's job to fight for them. Yes. So I'm going to yeah. elect you and you didn't do enough. And I'm going to get you the nomination. You know, we're going to go ahead and vote for you. And that was my part. I stuck my sign in the yard and then you didn't fight hard enough. And there were some anomalies with, with some of these vote counts and you didn't go and fundraise in order to uh, try to push back and jump on board with the, with the, um, you know, all of you didn't fix my kids' stolen. school in one election cycle. Well, the, uh, there there are <laughs> conservatives yeah, who are really strong conservatives who will turn around and go, but it's that person's job to fight because I elected them to fight or I I yeah. sent them to go fight. That's his job to fight. And and what they don't seem to catch on to is the entire other side. They are all activists. <laughs> I mean, every last one of them are activists. They None of them are like, we don't talk politics. No, they love to talk politics. They're going to hit you in the face with it every opportunity. And so, but our side wants to delegate their fight off to other people and get other people to do the fight for them. And then on top of that, you've got folks who have turned around and, and done that and go, oh, you're going to go fight for me. You're going to go do all of this stuff. And then the minute it falls short and you're not able to fight all of this on your own, they turn around and go, well, what's the point? What's the yeah. point of all of this? It's all going to go bad anyway. Uh, they, they're going to steal the election anyway. Everything's going to be like this anyway. So why am I even voting? And that, then that, you that get, becomes defeatism. You get these people that are totally on your political side, like on your ideological side, who are like, I don't even vote. I stopped voting. That's my protest. And I'm going, wow, how big of you? You know. And so, uh, so that's the la a little bit more on the lazy side, the people that gave up and the people that expect everyone else to do the fighting for them. No, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that is important. And we, we needed to, we needed to mention that because it's going to go into the next segment here. And that, that is, there, there's, there's another brand of laziness, which I think is ironic for conservatives. And that's when conservatives think, as Tina just articulated, well, I voted for you. How come you didn't fix it? And, and I, and I look back sometimes, like I've had people yell at me before. Like I said something about the Epstein list and like, well, what are you going to do about it? Like, well, I'm a state legislator. Yeah. So what are you going to do about it? Like, are Okay, I don't I don't control the FBI's budget. I don't control their processes. I don't I think you're looking for I think you're looking for a, a congressman or a senator. Like, oh, see another excuse. Like, no, you just don't understand how our actual system of government works and where the jurisdictions lie at. Yeah. But because people don't again, understand how the government works at all. 
No, and, and, and part of that is by design, right? Like part of that is right. because the government has become so massive with, with so many departments and such a huge bureaucracy that by design, it's impossible to really figure out. But I will say this, it, it gets incredibly frustrating when somebody will say, well, we elected you. How, how come you didn't get this done? I'm like, okay, well, you, you're right. You elected me. And I, and I carried the right legislation and I voted the right way and I argued for the things that I wanted and I tried to get other people to come down and testify as well. But at the end of the day, I, I don't control the House of Delegates. We don't control the Senate, right? Which means I can't, if I can't get the votes in the House or I can't get the votes in the Senate, then I can't get the bill to the governor's desk to actually sign. And they'll look at, well, they'll see another excuse. Okay, maybe maybe it is technically an excuse, but it's a pretty dang good one when it's an actual reflection of the way bills are passed in this country. And then what that leads to, and th that, that lack of understanding of how the process, again, if you're going to say you love the Constitution so much, but you have no concept of, of the structures that's actually put in place in, in order to get laws passed or to run the executive branch or the role of the judiciary, then I don't know what to tell you. Like, I have a hard time believing that you really love the Constitution if, if you don't even understand the things that it's put in place or you're blaming the wrong people for not getting what you want as a result of it. And, and I've, I've had this argument before with conservatives who were like, well, why can't we just do that? I'm like, well, because if the attorney general does that or the governor does that or the president does that or whatever it is, it, it would be a violation. Let me give you a perfect example of this. I, I had somebody from the right, right? It was, it was, it, this was a primary race. And they were saying that state, they were saying that local and state law enforcement should be required by law to rigorously enforce federal immigration law. And I said, whoa, wait a second. I said, I, I definitely agree that, you know, state and, and local law enforcement should cooperate with federal law enforcement, you know, to, to do X, Y, and Z. I said, but no, you, you can't make, you cannot make a local or a state agency. You cannot make their primary function to enforce a federal law. That's, that's not why they exist. And I got told, I got called a squish and I got told, I don't know what I'm talking about. And I got called, you know, I'm an open borders, you know, liberal or whatever it was. And I'm like, how am I the open board? You're the one that just said you want all state and local law enforcement to now be subject to federal law. Think about that for a second. You essentially federalized law enforcement all across the country. And, and you might like it when it comes to an issue like immigration. What happens when it's gun laws? Can, can we now throw a sheriff in jail for not adequately enforcing federal gun laws? Like, is that, is that the sort of system that you really want? Because it's not a federalist one. It's not one that respects separation of powers. It's not one which respects jurisdiction. It's not one which respects the 10th Amendment to the Constitution. But see, at that point, you had a politician that did a really good job whipping up frenzy around a legitimately bad issue, but then offering something that was horribly unconservative and, and ultimately would not have actually achieved the objective he wanted, which is secure the borders, which I absolutely believe. Not only that, but I believe that states have a right to prevent themselves from being invaded. But at the moment you say, we're going to now put the federal government in charge of determining whether or not a state or local law enforcement agency has sufficiently enforced federal law, you federalize that law enforcement now. There, there's nothing conservative about that. There is no respect for the Constitution in that particular approach. None. Zero. You know, it would be it, one thing for a state, and I've voted for legislation like this before, it would be one thing for a state to come in and tell your local and state law enforcement that, look, as long as you are going to receive state funds in order to carry out your responsibilities, you are not going to set up sanctuary cities where you refuse to work with federal law enforcement. You're not going to do that. That's a constitutionally appropriate way to go about doing this in order to protect and preserve separation of powers, the Tenth Amendment, federalism. But nope, nope, this guy, had, this guy had a message and he was going to go with it. And all of his people on tune went on Twitter, went on Facebook and everyone else like, oh, Nick's a squish. No, I'm actually preserving the Constitution yeah. in this process. And again, that's a result of, of, again, complacency and some degree of laziness with, I just want something done. I want it done now. Well, again, the whole concept of the American experiment it is not a an overarching, powerful federal government that can achieve anything you want anytime you want it to, right? The, the whole concept of the American experiment was we're going to limit government power 
so that we can actually encourage the flourishing of human freedom and individual liberty and personal responsibility and pri property rights. And that's really hard to do if you have a federal government that can essentially wield power however it feels like whenever it wants to. So that leads me into well, my, I, that leads us into our topical. second category. Some, some yeah. of that is topical. If you, if you talk to them about the gun laws situation and then you get got a sheriff who's like, I won't enforce those laws. In fact, I'll, I'll arrest federal agents for coming into my area and trying to, you know, like soft nullification where they, uh, I'll arrest people for trying to enforce this in my well, inner position uh, county yeah. or, oh, inner position. Well, but if you yeah. posit that type of thing to that same group of people, they'll go, yeah, we want that. Yeah. But what they don't understand is if you have the, if you have the freedom to do something like that, that means that the left has the freedom to do the same with their own issues. And then um, what I think a lot of people don't do is when they come up with an idea for a law or, you know, going, okay, I think we should have this law. They don't put it to any litmus test. And really a simple litmus test that anybody can do is this. This law that... I have the idea of doing, um, is this only good if my side's in charge or is it good no matter who's in charge? If your law yeah. that you want in place is only good if your side is in charge, it's a bad law. It's no mm -hmm. good. I'm sorry. That's a really simple litmus test you can do. If it stands strong and is a good law no matter who's in charge, like it can't be abused by one side or the other, Okay, now now then we can go to the next question on whether or not it's constitutional, whether or not it expands your freedoms. You know, you can go on from there. But like the very first thing is, can this be abused by either side? And or, if or somebody even else is, it likely is in to charge, be are, right? It, it it's one of those things where I love the idea of it when my people are in charge. We'll just you know round everybody up and shift them off somewhere, whatever, and <laughs> get rid of all of our problems with all these leftists. Great. Okay. So that's great when your people are in charge, but when the left's in charge, they're going to do the same back to you. This is not a good job, good law, you know? So anyway, I would just encourage people to kind of, when you're thinking about something like that, put it through a litmus test. And so, so what that all, what all, what that all creates is essentially is frustration, confusion, and then when you have frustration, and you have confusion and people can't properly map what's going on or why it's going on or what the what the solution is to it. That's when we move into our second category. And again, we're being a little bit flippant with these titles, but second category is crazy. Right. And, and it's the idea of um, unreasonable expectations and and I would say improper diagnosis. So when you improperly diagnose a, a problem. You're going to then come up with remedies for that problem. And when those remedies don't work, if, if you don't go back and, and recognize, okay, did we improperly diagnose something? Did we get something wrong? Well, then you're going to just try a different remedy for the same problem that you misdiagnosed. And the end result is people get frustrated when the remedies don't work. And so they start demanding ever increasing and more extreme and more draconian remedies because something's got to work. And, and, a lot of what fuels that is, is two, two things that fuel that, and I think this is really important for people, uh, for conservatives to understand. One of the things that fuels that is this, this, whole, um, this whole concept of disgust. One of the things that tends to really motivate conservatives into action, right? There's a lot of things that will happen where conservatives will be like, oh, I don't like that. But it, it's when they get truly disgusted with something that now they're motivated to act. And there's a reason why, I mean, you can say this is true of all of politics, right? But again, disgust is a, a particular motivator for conservatives. And it's one of the reasons why you will see a lot of um, the, the, the ads and whatnot generated to get you know, conservatives like off the couch and, and, and engaged is pushing toward that thing that is happening that they know they're going to have a deep visceral reaction to. And so there's the disgust component. But the, the other issue that is um, motivating for that is this idea of fear. It, it's not just that what is happening is wrong, but it's this idea that what is happening is becoming so predominant that if we don't act now and act quickly, we're going to lose everything. And the end result is, is that if I don't properly understand how my systems of government work in order to achieve the things I want, if I haven't properly diagnosed the problem to understand why it's there in the first place, then I'm setting myself up 
to come up with some pretty crazy explanations for why things are the way they are. And then when my solutions to those things don't work, I'm going to start leaning more and more on, again, more draconian solutions. And what people need to understand is that in, in the more organized areas of the left, that is exactly what they want. And, and this is not just me saying this. If you go read Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, which is I think it was published in 1971. This was like the, uh, he, he actually dedicated, I think, the first, um, the first uh, what do you call it? Uh, the first round of publishing to it. He, he actually dedicated it to Lucifer, right? So they, they didn't, he did not hide yeah, the ball Yeah, I've, I've got this, the quote right he, here. yeah. He says, you know, lest we off? forget at least, yeah, let, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical from all our legends, mythology, and history. And who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which? The first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that, it le um, that at least he won his own kingdom, Lucifer. So that's yeah. the opening line, by the way. <laughs> that's the first, I have a copy of Rules for Radicals. Uh, yeah. in, in my library. I think every conservative should have, uh, honestly, should have a copy of this book if you want to understand how the left operates um, mm -hmm. from, from a mechanical standpoint, not necessarily a philosophical standpoint, but from a mechanisms and actions. And these are the type of, of, of you know, decisions that you need to be making in order to, to achieve your end goal. And like I said, I mean, I think every conservative needs to read this book, not because necessarily it's a blueprint for what we should do, but instead it's a way for understanding how the left operates. In fact, I don't actually think rules for radicals can be replicated for the right um, for the mm -hmm. same reasons that, um, Nick, we did a podcast with Tina, um, I think maybe about a month ago, where I said things like, you know, why can't we have our own march through the institutions? Why can't we, <laughs> you know, just just repeat what, what Gramsci did and what, you know, Duchke talked about in, in the 1960s and stuff like that? You, the reason you can't is because conservatives and libertarians, by definition, are not, they don't have this herd mentality that leftists do. Leftists are sheep. You can herd sheep very easily. Libertarians are cats. You cannot herd cats. <laughs> and, and, and so... The, the things that the mechanisms that the that, that leftists can use in order to achieve power just can't be replicated. You can't simply say, let's take all these conservatives and march them through the institutions because conservatives um, con conservatives are, are more motivated by their own personal, you know, goals and motivations and desires in life. They have things they want to achieve and they don't need a political strongman to direct them. In, in a particular way in order for them to achieve those goals. They're going to go out there and start their own business or start their own company or invent something or, or create something. They're going to go build a legacy independent of that. They're, they're high-performing people. They simply are more prone to that. Go ahead. Even if we're being even if we're being generous, and we just say that, like, okay, we're not we're not saying herd in a pejorative sense. If we're saying that the the left is more collectivist, you know, mindset, and and they they don't see that as a as a detriment. They see that as well. Yes, you, you're only concerned about your own individual goals, whereas we are concerned about everybody. And and the the real problem there um, is that that that's actually a very very convincing narrative. It sounds very very tolerant. It sounds very very concerned with with society and humanity in general. The problem is is that when you look at their approach for taking care of humanity, what you end up finding out is that because they don't put sufficient emphasis on individual liberty or individual rights or individual uh, personal responsibility, you know, any, any sort of like, you can't have collective rights, all collective rights, uh, you know, everything, all rights have to start with the individual because if it's just the group that has rights and, and not the individual that has rights, well then you're, you're getting into some really problematic territory. But the, the whole concept of this, the whole point I want to get at is that again, the, the the conservative or the person on the right or the libertarian, whatever it is, um, and, and again, libertarians don't like to be necessarily classified with conservative, but the, the libertarian that has a, a very strong commitment to the non-aggression principle and classical liberalism and all these other things. If you take all those people and, and you don't have a, you don't have, again, you don't have a firm connection to the, the philosophy or the reasoning behind what you believe. If it's just a, a cultural thing where it's like, well, I was just raised this way, or I generally feel this way, or yeah, I'm patriotic, or I don't like what they're doing. Then when you look at something like rules for radicals and you look at the way they exploit, you look at the way that Saul Alinsky is encouraging people to exploit this. What he's saying is, is that the reaction is the, the reason why you engage in the action is to get the reaction. Right. So 
Saul Alinsky, what he's laying out for the people that are reading this, and understand, this is not just some weird track that was written by some guy in his basement that never achieved anything. This guy was one of the most influential uh, thinkers uh, on the left. I mean, Hillary Clinton dedicated, I think, her thesis to him. Like Barack Obama considered him an incredibly influential person in his own philosophical development. So it's not like this guy is just someone, it, it's not like there's some weird Antifa group that's reading Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals and nobody else. This guy wrote probably one of the premier tracks for collective and community action in the 20th century, um, at, at least in, in America. And what Saul Alinsky says in there is that there, one, of, one of the primary reasons why you're doing the things you do on the left is to generate an anticipated reaction from the right. So you do the thing in anticipation of the right reacting in a certain way, and then you immediately play the victim, right? And, and how many of us have seen that play out so many times where, uh, again, it, it's, it just seems like clown world, right? The, the drag queen shows up and gyrates in front of children at a bar, and our reaction is, what the hell is going on? And the left comes back with, why do you hate gay people? Wait, What? That was a that was a man dressed as a woman committing a sexual dance in front of children like that. That is what I have a problem with. Yeah, exactly. But really what you have a problem with is is this. And all of a sudden you find yourself defending something. You find yourself defending comments you made never made. You may find yourself defending stances that you never made. And, and again, because it seems like utter clown world, you, you all of a sudden you start to get frustrated and the more frustrated that you get with respect to an unreasonable person, the more prone you are to actually act unreasonable in kind or to actually act out in a way that is, let's say, more flippant or more cutting or whatever it may be. And that's what they're waiting for. Because the moment you do that, right, the moment you're yelling, the moment you're screaming, the moment you're doing one, that's the reaction that they want to capture in order to say, look, we told you this is who they were all along. We told you this is who they were. And look, they just proved it. And it doesn't matter if it's an isolated incident. It doesn't matter that all of the things that led up to that might have been perfectly reasonable. right? It doesn't matter that you're going to point out that they're, they're horrible hypocrites and that they're the same people that scream and yell at some poor retail worker at, at, at Safeway because they misgendered someone. It doesn't matter. The hypocrisy works in their favor because this is not about an individual issue. This is about moving the power, moving the Overton window in their direction. And they need your reaction to do it. Right? It's very important that, that conservatives understand that they are trying to generate a particular reaction. And when you give it to them in the form of crazy, you are playing their game, not your own. You're not like finally waking up to everything and standing up for them and calling them out for the, the liars that they are, right? Or whatever it is. When you respond crazy, you are giving them the reaction they want. It is a baited ambush, right? They are enticing you to go down a particular road. They are enticing you to behave in a particular way so that they can then exploit it. Now, does, does that mean you don't call out what they're doing? Does that mean that you don't um, fight against it? Absolutely not. You have to do those things. Right? But if you choose to fight crazy with crazy, I guarantee you they will win. And the reason why is very simple. Their side, their argument, the larger argument that they're making that's rooted in critical theory, that's rooted in all that, they see crazy as a useful tactic. And they, and they understand how it's being utilized. And they respect it. And they understand it. And they utilize it to great effect. When a conservative acts crazy, other conservatives look at it and go, that's crazy. You probably shouldn't be doing that. Until you get a critical mass of conservatives acting crazy, and then all of a sudden it gets very dangerous, and that's going to be the third part that we talk about right now. So right. What, what do I mean by crazy? Now, first of all, I don't mean crazy by pointing out that the, the government or the left engages in conspiracies at times. I don't, I don't, that's not, it's not crazy to be skeptical of what the mainstream media tells you. It's not, it's not crazy to be skeptical of the motivations behind the WEF or the WHO or, or the, you know, academia. That's not, that's, that is all, that's well documented to look at what they're saying, their motivations, their past, what they've done and said, I don't trust this. Okay. But when, when all of a sudden you immediately jump to whatever is the most fantastic explanation, the most fanatical explanation possible for every single thing that becomes problematic. 
because what we're essentially doing now is we're taking well, wait, wait, let me finish this thought. What we're doing is we're taking Occam's razor, right? The idea of, of um, you know, using a logical thought process to understand that sometimes, oftentimes the simplest solution is, is the most credible, or at least the one you should start with. We're throwing on that all out and we're saying, no, 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 everything is some sort of evil Bond villain that is pulling a string or everything is, is a horrible government cover up. And, and, Again, what it does is it makes it makes our side very easy to manipulate. So keep in mind what I'm saying here. I'm not saying don't be skeptical. I'm not saying that you know there aren't such a thing as, as the government engaging in, in conspiratorial behavior. Absolutely. I am saying that if the moment you see something, it's it's automatically aliens or you know whatever. That's going to cause people to, to conclude attacked. that you're not you're not capable of actually you know developing a logical pattern to think about these things and to think about what could potentially cause something. And, and the more you get, the more it becomes apparent that that's the way that you operate, the more that it becomes apparent that that's your natural conclusion, the less likely are you, the less likely you are to be believed when you're actually right. And that's, that's problematic. Go, go ahead. Um, I just Tina. wanted to bring up the fact that, um, a lot of the way that the lazy sort of feeds into the crazy or unhinged, if you will, is um, sometimes I think that conservatives suddenly realize where we are and they realize how many people are just blindly following the left, just going so hard that direction. And it's a lot easier to explain it away with conspiracy than to explain it away with, here's what we did wrong. Here's how we mess this up because we let them take over academia. We let them take over everything. But instead, we're going to go ahead with this conspiracy that uh, the airplanes are flying over and gassing everybody with mind control stuff. And that's why everybody is falling in line. And I want to look at that and go, oh, you don't think that putting kids in an institutional setting from five years old all the way up to 22, 23 years old, you don't think that had a little something to do with it? You, you don't think the fact that they have taken that completely over and the media and entertainment, you don't think that has something to do with it? You think that they're taking, you know, uh, airplanes across the country and all the little chemtrails that you see in the sky, that's falling down. And that's causing all of us to, to move to the left and, and it weakens our minds and it's, and then they can do mind control. So there's a lot of conspiracies, um, that are in that vein where it's like, oh, they're putting this into the water and now we're going to be controlled or they're, they're releasing these force fields and, and the 5g is going to cause everybody to be under this control because they've inserted this metal into everybody's veins through the jab now and now everyone's going to be like robots doing and i'm just looking at this going you guys are you sure it's not because of all these other things that really did happen where we dropped the ball you, are you sure it's not that and and so sometimes i feel like it's the lazy thing to do because what you're doing is you're taking all the responsibility off of us and our ability to um persuade people and um, show them the truth and help them to get on the right track. You know, you're taking all of that away and um, and now inserting this idea that the government's just doing mind control. Tina, you're an expert on these conspiracy theories. <laughs> okay, so here's what I mean by all this. And again, the, the point is not to accuse every conservative that is, is highly skeptical of what's going on around them of being a, you know, a, a loon or a crazy person. That's not it. What needs to be understood is what the what the left wants. And by the left, I'm talking about like the Saul Linsky types. They want the right to respond in a way that is crazy because that is how they capture your reaction to their action and then make it the catalyst for achieving what they want within the larger population. Right? That that is they spell it out. This is this is not me engaging in conspir conspiratorial theory. They spell it out in 13 Rules for Radicals or in Rules for Radicals. And then there's now another book called Beautiful Trouble, which essentially articulates the same thing, that your reaction is the action that they're looking for because that's what they're going to utilize to advance their agenda. So don't give it to them 
Because here's what ends up happening. Once you get once you get this critical mass within the conservative movement, this critical mass within the right that now suddenly believes that everything is beyond their control and everything is being run by some sort of cabal and that everything is a conspiracy and everything, you know, that the only way to explain what's going on within the world right now is that there's, there's some sort of CD government conspiracy that controls everything. If that's it, well then what the right is naturally going to conclude is that things like, free market principles and freedom of inquiry and freedom of speech and uh, limited constitutional government and putting a check on executive power that essentially that all failed us. And now that the only way we're going to save America or save society is that if we adopt the left's tactics. Now I'm not suggesting that the right doesn't adapt their tactics and better understand what is being done in order to effectively respond to it. I'm saying that there are people within the right now that honestly believe that we're at a point where, hey, you just fight fire with fire. And if rules for radicals works for us, then maybe it's time for us to be the radicals on our side. My point is, if you do that, you will destroy the very thing that you're trying to protect. And, and Christian has talked a lot about this, about on how this manifests itself in reality. Because essentially, when you've been gaslit enough, and when you've been lied to enough, and when you feel as if you just have no control, whether it be your school or your politics or, or entertainment, or when you feel like completely isolated, the tendency is to find somebody, anybody that's going to promise you that they can fix it. And they're going to, they're going to stick it to all the people that have been sticking it to you. And all you need to do is just excuse them this power that they need because they're going to use it for all the good reasons. And they need you to be on board with that. So, Christian, you tell me, do you think that I am, um, you know, overstating this way that the, the lazy kind of leads to the crazy, which leads to the ugly manifestation, uh, on the right. And, and ultimately what I believe manifests itself in right wing authoritarianism, which in, in my opinion is the very destruction of the thing that the right should be fighting to preserve. Maybe over or understating it is, is probably not the, the dichotomy that I would look at here. I, what I would probably say is that I don't think that the that this this what I've increasingly called the dark side of the right. I don't think that that's motivated by by people going crazy. I, I in fact I think precisely the opposite. I don't think it's the crazies out there that you know have have been parroting all the conspiracy theories that that Tina was just talking about recently. I, I think it's actually people that have have correctly identified the problem. And have come to a conclusion that is actually entirely sane if you think about it. I, absent of the morality behind it, I think that, that the, the real danger here is what do you do when the good guys turn evil, so to speak? And, and to use some analogies here, um, you know, there, there's a line in the beginning of The Lord of the Rings where um, Frodo learns what the ring is that Bilbo, his uncle, has given him. And, and he's having this conversation with Gandalf about it. And he learns this terrible truth about how, how evil this ring is and it can bring about basically the destruction of the world. And, 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 you know, this is a hobbit that's like spent his whole life in the Shire. He doesn't really want to go on this big adventure to Mordor and destroy it. So he tries to give the ring to Gandalf. You know, he's like, here, you deal with the problem. And Gandalf says no. In fact, like vehemently so. He, he gets angry at, at Frodo. And he's like, you know, eventually he finally interrupts mm -hmm. Frodo. And he's like, do not tempt me. And Frodo's like, w what do you mean? And, and Gandalf, who's very wise, obviously, that's, you know, he, he fits that trope. You know, Gandalf tells him that if I were to accept the ring, I would have a desire to do good. But through it, I, I would be manifesting evil. And he doesn't want to be tempted by by somebody offering him the ring because he knows that as powerful as somebody like Gandalf is, if he were to take the ring, he would be the most powerful person in the world. And even if he might have good intentions, which he does, Gandalf is inherently a good person um, in this story. Even though he might have good intentions at first, the ring would end up corrupting him over time. And there's a similar analogy, by the way, Tolkien probably pulled this, this story of the, the ring or, or the, um, the role of the ring when he created Lord of the Rings, he probably actually took it from a from a um, story in Greek mythology about the Ring of Gyges. It's it's not it's kind of forgotten today, but the story of the mm -hmm. Ring of Gyges is similar. That there's this person named Gyges who discovers a ring in a cave. So you see where the analogy is going here, and he discovers that the ring turns him invisible. So yeah. again, even more even more closer analogy here. And what Gyges does when he takes this ring, Gyges is a totally normal person. Not a bad guy, not necessarily a good guy, but he's just a normal person. He takes this ring, he discovers that he can become invisible with it, and then he realizes that he can do anything. 
now that he's invisible. And so then he goes to like the king of Lydia. He murders the king of Lydia. He seduces his wife and sleeps with her. He overthrows the government. It's a Greek mythology. So there's all sorts of like crazy stories in yeah. there. But basically, you know, he like, you know, steals the king's wife, murders the king, overthrows the government, becomes king himself and becomes this incredibly corrupt, evil person that realizes that he can just rape anybody or steal from anybody or, or do anything because he's invisible whenever he puts this ring on. And so the the story of the Ring of Gyges, and it's, it's part of a dialogue um, where Plato's debating a few other people about what does it mean to be good. And the story of the Ring of Gyges is one that I think that somebody like Jordan Peterson would actually appreciate because it illustrates that this seemingly benign object, the ring does not have a power of itself. It corrupts other people. Now, in Tolkien's story, the ring does have, have a power of itself. It is Sauron. This is the reason why, like, Boromir, when he's saying, well, why don't we just take the ring and use mm -hmm. it to defeat Sauron? What he's forgetting in, in, in making this argument is you cannot use the ring to defeat Sauron because the ring is Sauron. If you take possession of the ring, you will become evil. Mm -hmm. It will corrupt you. And then you will end up, even if you might at first have good intentions, defeating Sauron, the source, you know, the most evil person in the world in this story, even though you might have good intentions, you will end up perpetuating evil and you will just simply manifest himself through your actions. And so why do I bring up all these stories? The reason I bring up all these stories is because I think the dark side of the right, and that's a term that I first used in our right wing backlash episode in May 2023. I highly recommend you go back. If you're, if you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening in your car, I highly recommend you go back and you watch this episode about is there a right-wing backlash coming, where we respond to a video from Rudyard at What If Alt Hist about what he thinks is going to be a potential right-wing backlash in the future. In the last hour of that conversation, it's myself and Nick and Hamilton at the table, and I'm bringing up some really deep stuff where I said something that Nick almost interrupted me on um, and because I think that he was about to actually defend me when I said... I'm terrified of what's going to happen, and I think it's going to be perpetuated by people like me. And then Nick was like, well, I don't know about that. And I was like, no, 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 wait, hear, hear me out. The reason I say this is because, let's be honest, the left has created a bunch of scapegoats through everything that they push. Everything that has come out of this cultural Marxist tradition, there's an enemy. It's an oppressor-oppressed dichotomy, right? It's men are oppressors, white people are oppressors and white men are the ultimate oppressors. Christianity is oppressive. You know, colonialism, America, the West, capitalism, they're, they're, they're all oppressors. And everything is about oppressed versus oppressor. And eventually when you've grown up your entire life and you've just been told over and over and over again that you are evil, the left doesn't look at people as being good and evil. They don't look at it this way that, that mankind has a capacity for both good and evil. They look at it as this is a battle between people that are inherently good and people that are inherently evil, and they are inherently good, and we are inherently evil. Whereas conservatives, the conservative tradition should be, and Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot, that no matter how able, there's a piece of cane in you no matter how able you think you are, and that you have a capacity for both incredible good and incredible evil. And the left doesn't look at it that way. And so if you've grown up your entire life being told by the people that control all the culturally shaping institutions in the world or in the United States or in the West, that you are evil, they don't hate you because they think you're a racist. They hate you because you're white. They don't hate you because they think that you're a misogynist. They hate you because you are a man. Well, eventually you're just going to end up concluding if all of, if, if, if it's simply just about power structures and it's simply a debate between oppressors and the oppressed, well, I'll tell you this, I am absolutely not going to be oppressed by anyone. And if that requires me oppressing you in order to prevent mm -hmm. myself being oppressed, then so be it. If, that, if that's the game that we're going to play, then I'm not going to play to lose because you're a bunch of losers and you've made the fact that you are losers your identity and you've claimed a sense of moral superiority by the fact that you are losers. And, and Nick and I have, have argued all day long about about. The, um, the, the language of the phrase losers here. What I mean by this is people that have True. convinced themselves that, that they are victims of either circumstances or other people or the environment or the power structures that be, right? This is all what, what DEI, this is all what cultural Marxism, this is, this is all what it says, that, that you know, society is, has, has created this, this hegemony that defends the status quo and we need to deconstruct that in order to establish a new status quo. And so they've created this, this idea that we are all losers 
for varying reasons, and we've made that a central part of our identity, and that has given us a sense of moral superiority. Well, what happens when the right stops caring about the, the alleged moral superiority of the left? And I think that we're getting to that point. We did a episode about the um, mental illness that exists within the left, the personality disorder pandemic, as I believe what we called it. And there was a study there. There was a, a, a paper there that I read off or that, that Nick read off at, at the very end that I discovered right before we started recording. And there was something in that paper where the authors were talking about how when the Great Awakening began about 10 years ago, the initial reaction from the right was, was feelings of guilt and, and a, a lot of emotions around regret and remorse and being upset and offended because the left started becoming not just disagreeing like, you know, again, what the top, tar- you know, top marginal tax rate should be. The left started accusing the right of being evil of being bad guys, of being racists, of being bigots, of being homophobes and transphobes and and in everything under the sun. And the rights of first response was, hold on, I'm not this terrible person that you think I am. I'm reasonable. Why are you being so so upset with me? Why are you being so so mean towards me? Why are you being so aggressive towards me? That was the first reaction. And so when the Great Awakening began, you saw a spike in in mental illness within the right as well, with with things like depression especially among younger conservatives that were in the university system at the same time that their peers were basically saying, you are evil. You are the bad guy. You are everything that is wrong with society. I remember sitting in those college classes and and hearing other students basically rail against white men and how we need to kick them out of all positions of power and authority in this country because they're the bad guys. Not because they have bad ideas or because some people have bad ideas that happen to be white men. No, no, no. The problem was we need to decolonize all of our, our, you know, institutions from whiteness. Again, it's the phrase that, that I said earlier. They don't hate you because they mm-hmm. think you're a racist. They hate you because you are white. They hate you because you are a man. And when you realize eventually that you're dealing with people who have that mindset, at first, you don't think that they have that mindset and you think that they're bringing up legitimate grievances. And then you learn they're not legitimate grievances. They just want to hurt you. They well, and that's why we've stopped apologizing. Exactly. That's why we've gotten to the point well, where the minute you apologize, it's over for you. You're canceled. You're done. But if you double down and you become, if you double down and you triple down, you're uncancelable at that point. Um, unless they've got control over, you know, bank accounts and mm-hmm. social credit score type things. But um, the right has now gotten to the point where we don't, even when we're wrong, we don't apologize now because they will jump on it and you'll it, you'll ride this thing all the way out to its cancellation. And um, and I think that you're so you're seeing us start to go, no, this is what I believe, period, the end, deal with it. And if, if they've got a problem with it, then you can come back and be like, oh, I'm sorry that you suck and I still believe what I believe. You know, and so we've just gotten to the point where we disregard everything um, and and we don't I mean, we. There are times when we're wrong about things. It's not as often, right? <laughs> no, there's times when we're wrong about things, but we don't we don't uh, <laughs> cop to it a lot of times now because because there's there is no redemption in the religion of the left. I think we're I think we're coming to a point and and um, the Christians point about this idea that it's not it's not that it's not that people are coming to these conclusions because they're crazy. It's because they're they're watching a particular pattern take place. And and all of the all of the let's say the old ways or methods of combating that don't seem to work anymore. Like for instance, when when you bring up a claim of of racism, like every every conservative that I would say that I'm associated with or know, like if you bring up a claim of racism, the, our question would be like, okay, racism is bad. So what is the evidence of racism in this situation? And then we will look at the evidence and we'll say, okay, well is this a is this a question of of racism or is this a question of something else? Like you know, what what is actually going on? And again, it's that whole proper diagnosis of the problem. Because if it is racism, then uh, then the practical universal response is, yeah, that's bad and that shouldn't happen. Now the next question is, how how do we address what has happened and how do we prevent it from happening? And, and as long as the, as long as the conversation was going in that direction, there may be times where we disagree about the motivation behind something, or maybe times where we disagree about the way to address it. But we, we agreed that something had an objective definition and we could look at evidence and then we could work together in order to determine how to, um, 
you know, how to do restitution with respect to someone that might have been a victim of something and how to prevent someone from being a victim in the, in the future and how to punish for someone that was engaging in the victimization. And, and what we ended up learning was, is that everything like all, all of a sudden when we had done a fairly good job of, of defining the problem, diagnosing the problem when it takes place and addressing the problem after the fact, what we, what we kept hearing was, well, that's just a good first step. Like, wait a second, you're, you're telling me billions of dollars in reparations would be a good first step. Like, wasn't, wasn't the eradication of slavery, the good first step, like wasn't, but then the other thing that we ended up learning was all of a sudden when the supply of racism far outstripped the demand of the activists who, who make a good living or have a political objective surrounded by it, when, when the, when the supply outstripped the demand, they just changed the definition in order to create a whole new source of supply. And and that's the part where again I I think Christian's onto something where he says that there there is a pathway for very reasonable conservatives to find themselves in a situation where they feel like the since the old standards no longer apply new tactics will have to be um, uh, relied upon. My concern is that I can look at that and say, yeah, absolutely, we we have to identify that a new tactic is being used and we have to call it out and we also have to understand that somebody that is not willing to engage in in reason uh, or or discourse where there's such a thing as objective truth and objective morality to where which allows us to use our different perspectives and critical thinking to come to a, a conclusion, even if that conclusion is, is, hey, you know, we politely and respectfully disagree, but we're not going to kill one another over it. If, if that's no longer the mechanism, if somebody now has been convinced that, yeah, I see this thing going on, but I don't actually recognize the source of it. And at this point, I don't care anymore because I've been so offended. I've been so disgusted, not just with what's going on toward me, but with my own side's approach to it, that at this point I'm done waiting. And if that's if those are the sort of tactics that work, then maybe they need to feel them as well. And that's the part where I think it gets incredibly dangerous because as we've said before, right, it's... It's it, well, it's the whole ring of Sauron example that you use. Yeah. If you're using a tactic which will, by definition, corrupt or destroy the thing that you're defending, then you've lost all connection with why you were fighting in the first place. And when when people when people do that, and they lose connection to that that underlying morality which informs what they're doing, that's when they can be convinced of just about anything, if it means preservation of the group or more importantly punishment of the other side that's what's that's what goes into the side of what i consider to be like the very very dark um the very dark manifestation of this if you were to take tolkien's analogy and you you replace sauron with power and the ring still exists though this is where you get into a huge problem because power can never fully disappear there is no true state of nature. I don't care what you know Henry David Thoreau talks about or anything like that. Like it, it there, power will always exist in some manifestation. The question is who gets to wield it, and so that is an entirely different problem because I think there's a lot of people on the right that have concluded there is no Mordor, there is no Mount Doom for you to throw the ring into. The ring exists. The question is who's going to be wielding the ring? Mm. Is it going to be my enemies wielding the ring against me to yeah. hurt me and everything that I find beautiful and true and worth sacrificing for and defending in this world? Or am I going to be wielding the ring? And yes, I might break some eggs in the process and crack some heads mm. and there might be a bit of a mess, but I'll tell you this. If, if, if the left wins, civilization itself will be destroyed. The Western world will will fall into ruin. It will be this to use the phrase. It will be the zombie apocalypse if the left wins. If I win, there's at least a chance that we can save civilization. There's at least a chance that we can save the West. And if that is but the, that's, the that's conclusion, the problem. If, that's but, the but problem. Nick, if that is I, the conclusion that the right draws. And yeah. increasingly, I believe that they are starting to draw that conclusion. If that is the conclusion that the right draws, what would you not do? In order to save civilization itself, the stakes are so high. I, 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 unfortunately, because of the the distance between us right now, you're in Richmond and Warren Culpepper right now. I was about to say a quote when you were speaking earlier, so I'm sorry for interrupting you. That might be my first time ever apologizing for interrupting somebody. But um, there's a quote from H.L. Mencken, and you probably know it, Nick, <laughs> that, that he says, you know, every normal man must be tempted at times to spit on his hands, hoist the black flag, and begin slitting throats. And... I, I think that, that again, the, I, I believe that the, the right is starting to come to this conclusion that, you know what, 
We keep losing because we're having these pseudo intellectual debates with disingenuous people that simply want to use dialectics, Hegelian dialectics in order to hurt us and destroy again, everything that we find to be true and beautiful and worthy of, of defense and sacrifice in this world. And the time for debate, the time for discussion that is over. There is no debate or discussion to be had. The Marxists in the world want to destroy everything that is worth defending for, and I will do anything in order to defeat them. And this is why I think that the, the right is, is, is going to increasingly get to this, this black and white thinking, zero-sum thinking, because quite frankly, the left has pushed them in that direction. Oh, yeah. Just look at, look at the fact that they now say that uh, words are violence. There are certain words you can say, if you misgender me, that's an act of violence violence and they make no distinction between physical violence and words being violence so the reason why they call whatever you're saying violence is so that they can then carry out physical violence against you when that's what you're dealing with well of course people on the right are going to start going there is no talking to this person because if i talk it's violence and then they can use physical violence against me why don't we just cut out the middleman and i'll just start with physical violence against you it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, we all know how this is going to end, so let's just skip right to the point. Right. Because you keep hearing people say, you know, oh, when are we going to get to the shooting war? And that's, I hear that all the time. I will say this, that's usually said by people that have never been in a shooting war. Yeah. Um, and, and this is one of those things where I, I do believe, and, and this frustrates me, because a lot of the people that talk so flippantly of violence have never actually had to engage in any. Right. Um, that's not everybody, but a, a lot of the people that are so flippant about it. And that's the thing. Like, I don't want to see that happen to my country. I don't want to see the, the debates that we have in this country descend into nothing more than who can apply the most brute physical force toward the other side in order to achieve compliance. And, and it's, it's that idea of, you know, the, the speech that you had us listen to earlier from that one show where it was talking about, you'll be able to conquer. You just won't be able to convince. And a lot of people become, a lot of people have become convinced that I'll settle for conquering if that's all that's left to me. But here's the part that I want to, here's the part that I want to wrap this up with. Nick, Nick, Nick but, but before you wrap up though, I, I just want to give some brief context to what you were just talking about for a second ago about this thing that I sent you and Tina right before we started recording. Um, we were having a conversation about this topic like we normally do and this is for the audience to give them the context. I, I was bringing up this um, famous debate that took place in Spain at the very start of the Spanish Civil War in 1936. There was this professor of um, philosophy, and um, he, was, he was giving a lecture in, I believe, Salamica. And um, uh, the, the guy's name was Miguel Unamundo. Um, uh, and Unamundo was a classical liberal. In, in the truest sense, he he was, you know, he, he believed in many of the same fundamental principles that, that we would argue that the United States was originally founded upon. And he, he opposed the Republicans at the start of the Spanish Civil War because he looked at the factions within the Republican wing of, of, of you know, Spanish society and concluded that the, the Stalinists, the Marxists, the Bolsheviks, they're really actually kind of the ones running the show and they've created this mess. And so he originally supported the nationalists, if anything else, to restore order in Spain because he genuinely was concerned that there was going to be a Russian, you know, Russian revolution type situation in Spain and that classical liberalism was going to be trampled underneath Marxism. And I think he was absolutely right in that, that analysis. But what he concluded very early on within the, the first year of the Spanish Civil War was that the nationalists were not offering a restoration of liberty. The nationalists were offering a brand of right-wing authoritarianism simply as an alternative to Marxism and Bolshevism. And he gave this speech where he was, he was in some ways debating with some of these generals on the nationalist side that were supporting Franco. And Unamuno said something along the lines of, you know, M Marxism and fascism in, in many respects are two sides of the same coin. You and he was speaking to these these national soldiers here in the assembly hall, and he, he said, you know, you will conquer because you have brute force, but you will not convert because you cannot convince in order to convince you need to use reason and, and intelligence and logic. And you're not applying any of those things. You're simply driven by by bloodlust, by a desire to to 
to just just exterminate these these people that are your ideological enemies. And he went on to say, look, they're my ideological enemies as well. But but you you can kill all the Marxists you possibly want, but you cannot kill the ideology of Marxism. And if anything else, it will provide a sense of moral superiority to those who hold those views to raise a new generation of those to to point at, at the atrocities that your regime is going to perpetuate and say, see, look, we were the good guys all along. And unfortunately, after he gave that speech, the nationalist soldiers shouted him down and called him a traitor and a red and and basically bullied him out of the out of the assembly hall and he at that point he realized that there there is no winning from his point of view he 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 thought that he was alone and he spent the rest of his life basically in house arrest and watched you know two authoritarian sides duke it out with each other and he was more sympathetic to the nationalists he was more sympathetic to franco than the marxists but that doesn't mean that he he was supportive of franco anymore it was just simply well it's just the lesser of two evils and he wasn't really satisfied with the lesser of two evils and I do think, you know, I, I wrote about this on Twitter recently, and I'm, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I think there's one more thing to be said here that, that we haven't brought up. And so before you close this out, I really want your take, Nick and Tina, on, on this. Nick, you and I have talked about this in the last few days, but I want to bring it up in front of our audience because we've talked about at the very beginning of the show the institutional capture of the left. And how you got laziness in the sense of we handed over these institutions to the left. We just allowed them to all be hijacked one by one by one. Conservatives by nature usually tend to be the ones who defend institutions. That's one of the defining features of conservatism is the preservation of the institutions that you think are critical to preserving a culture, a society, a civilization, a nation. That's what conservatives do. It's not the only thing that conservatives do, but that's one of the central components of conservatism is preservation of that which your forefathers fought for and built, those institutions. And what you've seen, and, and I, 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 like I said, I wrote this on Twitter a, a few weeks ago, is that you know, ask yourself why the right is abandoning our democracy. Is it because they're just comically evil cartoon characters? Remember, that's what the left says, right. that it's just good people versus bad people. Is it because they're comically evil cartoon characters or is it because they correctly see that when the left waxes poetically about our democracy, what they mean is that it's theirs, not yours. The right is abandoning democracy because from their point of view, they see the game as rigged. And I don't mean my 2020 election was rigged, kind of rigged. I mean rigged to its very core. All of the major American institutions, with the exception of half of the church and most of the military has been completely ideologically captured by the left. Many are now openly arrayed against them, and the right has responded to this relentless hostility accordingly. They have zero faith in the media, academia, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, Wall Street, the arts, and the federal government. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is actually, and this is, where I, uh, th this is where I'm going with all this. This is actually a really dangerous situation. I'm not going to keep reading for myself because I already know how to say this. When conservatives have concluded that the institutions that conservatives usually are the ones who are defending have actually become the enemy, have been hijacked by the enemy, now two things happen. One, they stop defending those institutions because why would you defend that which your enemy occupies? Two, they're now seeking to tear down those institutions because they correctly have, have determined there is no saving Berkeley. There is no saving Harvard. There is no saving the New York Times. There is no saving Hollywood. There is no saving Silicon Valley or Wall Street. We're going to destroy those institutions because they are controlled by our enemies and they're being wielded against us to hurt us. What has happened is that conservatives have now become reactionaries. They've actually become revolutionaries and history has shown me that conservatives, when they become revolutionaries, that is an incredibly dangerous thing. That is an incredibly dangerous thing because conservatives make for absolutely brutal revolutionaries. And I think that you just can look at Italy, Germany, or Spain to see proof of that. Wow. I think... Um I, I don't, I, I've always had a hard time with this idea that um, the, the right wing just by its very nature becomes brutal revolutionaries because a lot of people would argue, well, wait a second, what, what, do, you, what do you consider the American Revolution 
other than a bunch of people that initially started off trying to regain what they believed to be their natural rights as English born citizens. And then a departure from England in an attempt to set up something that would set up a, a new system of government, which would actually protect those rights. And, and there's, there's even been some people that have theorized that the, the American revolution was not so much uh, a, a revolution in the sense that it, 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 it started off trying to upend a, an inherent system. They thought it was corrupt. They thought that there was a corrupt player within that in the form of King George and in the form of parliament to some degree. Um, but but here's what I'll say. The, the reactionary, and I make a distinction between reactionary and revolutionary. Um, and, and, I, and I think there is something to be said that the, the reaction, again, if, if we go back, don't take my word for it. Go read Saul Alinsky. Go read Beautiful Trouble. Go read... Um, you know, Herbert Marcuse, uh, Marcusa, and, and you'll, you'll see all of them essentially talking about something very similar. And that is they're going to engage in actions which will um, cause the sort of conservative reaction or right wing reaction that they can un- then utilize in order to achieve their objectives. And so I, I think the, the danger, as you expressed before, is this idea of conservatives getting to a point where they believe that every single institution that they would have otherwise fought for has been so co-opted that essentially it needs to be torn down and rebuilt. And, and here's what I would say to that. When I talk about trying to avoid you know, uh, violence within our system and whatnot, that doesn't mean I'm incapable of violence and it doesn't mean that I never, I, I can't imagine a situation where using physical resistance um, when it be necessary. That's not me. Um, I, I obviously believe that there that the American Revolution was justified. I, I obviously believe that civil disobedience ha- has been justified at, at times within our history. I obviously believe that there are times when even violence can be justified, provided that it's it's in defense of the innocent or defense of, of the just against those who are actively trying to take it down. And by that, I don't mean someone that has a different idea than you or, or even a- a- attempts to um, a- a- attempts to achieve a-, a different outcome than you. There's a very there's a very big difference between someone that's actually using physical violence in order to try to you know reshape something or take something from you versus someone that has a different opinion and is engaging in, in the battle of ideas. I make that distinction. But to your point, a lot of the, I think what, what certain elements within the conservative movement right now have become convinced of is this is an existential fight. And because it's an existential fight, all the rules go out the window. Um, the problem that I have is that what some people on the right are suggesting or what they're moving toward. And again, I think it's, I think it's a smaller element, but I, I see, I see it gaining popularity in certain wings, which gives me more concern is the sort of reaction that the left is actually looking for. And and look, I I think the woke, I think the woke version of the left is going to find out that they lose no matter what happens. There, There is no scenario where the woke left wins because they don't, they don't have them. They, they're good at one thing, and that's grievance. They're good at grievance and activism. They're not good at building things. They're not good. At, they're good at co-opting organizations or institution, but they're not good at producing things of, of general value that a society requires in order to survive and thrive. And and you you've seen this in in every single authoritarian regime where they were trying to undermine the current power. They loved using activists. They didn't always take the version of woke, whether it was like Mao's red guards or it was, you know, some other manifestation of that. Christian and I like to joke that the the first people to the the first people that die in a revolution are are the 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 established power. The second people to die are the revolutionaries. Right? It's it's not a shocker that Robespierre was killed by a revolution he helped start and 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 foster. Because at some point it becomes no longer ne- once you've once you've taken out the existing order once you've taken out the existing power structure, the the people trying to establish a new one don't have a lot of use for people that are good for nothing except overthrowing current power structures. So the woke doesn't win. No matter who wins, the woke loses. Period. The problem is is that as as Christians articulated, as Rutger articulated, as as Tina's talked about as well here is that. If the right becomes a version of itself, which abandons the the very principles, which gives it some sort of moral authority, and it surrenders all that for the desire to essentially survive or just win, 
and it's willing to resort to authoritarian measures in order to do it. The bottom line is it's also going to create a world nobody wants to live in. Um, it's also going to create a world completely devoid of any sort of moral justification for its own existence. And that's the part, that's the part that I rail against on my own side. It, it's Again, it's not that I don't think that there's never a time to, to stand up and physically defend yourself for the things that you believe or the things that you love. It's this idea that, well, if it's good for the other side to utilize, then it's good for us to utilize. That's the part that is so morally deficient. That's the corrupting element of power that will destroy anybody that chooses to wield it. And so the question is, is, okay, well, what do you do in a situation where one side doesn't seem to mind wielding it? And, and I think one of the beautiful things about the, the attempt that our founding fathers made um, was this idea that, to, to Christian's point, there is no Mordor. There is no place where you throw the ring and it, it's destroyed and it's gone forever and you don't got to worry about it anymore. It will always exist in some, in some element and there will always be people that want to use it and, and wield it. And the system that was originally set up and I think what was so beautiful about it was that idea was the recognition that it does exist. And so how many safeguards do we put in place to disperse it, to make sure that it can't be wheeled arbitrarily by one person or by one particular interest group at the expense of everybody else? How do we do that? And, and I think a lot of respect needs to be given for what they put in place. I think the problem is, is that when you saw the general erosion over time, of those safeguards because people convince themselves, well, that might have been relevant back then, but it's not relevant now. We're enlightened. We're better than that. We would never do those things. Look at how much, look at how morally superior we are and how much more enlightened we are and how much more knowledge and information that we have. We we know better than to use the power for those, those ignoble purposes. And the bottom line is, no, we don't. The, the human practices, human traditions. Um, human levels of acceptability for for certain things can can all adjust and change based off of circumstances and time and technology and a number of those things and in many cases they should depending on what it is but but human nature is amazingly similar throughout space and time and and this is the part where again my Christian faith informs that in such a way as to say that yeah there is a sinful nature if if you're not someone that is is particularly religious you might chalk it up to somebody something else but for us it's that idea that there is a sinful nature and that there is there is but the, by the same token there's objective morality and there's objective truth and there's a responsibility to fight against it and that's the part where again if the conservative movement if the right in general uh, does not recognize that the sort of power that is being wielded against us will be just as corruptive and just as corrosive if we try to wield it in the same way, then, then ultimately we're, we're still going to end. We're, we're not going to preserve Western civilization. We're not going to preserve the United States or, or the principles of the ideals that we love. We'll simply make sure that it dies by suicide as opposed to an invader. And I don't. I think if we don't properly recognize that, two things are going to happen. One, we're going to go down a very, very dark road that's not going to be beneficial for any of the things that we claim to believe in. And two, we're not going to actually recognize that there is an answer for this. And that answer doesn't come in, in being lazy and, and allowing for institutions that we, we know or we love to be completely co-opted and used for purposes which we think are antithetical to the sort of world that we want to live in. It doesn't come from the crazy thing where we just sit back and we just decide that everything is everything is some sort of conspiracy so far out of our control that we can't do anything about it. And it doesn't come from us turning to the dark side and then utilizing the very things that might have been utilized against us. It, it really comes from first and foremost recognizing that you have to get your own house in order. Here's the amazing thing that I want people to understand. You're really only one generation, maybe two generations away from completely blunting all of these attacks that we see. You really are. And, and what I mean by that is, as I look at the relationship that I have with my children, right? I, I, see, I see three kids that seem to be very, gosh, two of them are adults now that seem to be quite at home with what they believe and why, and, and willing to defend it in difficult situations. So the, the question that I ask is, is before, before anybody gets you know, caught up in, in things that are so far beyond their control that they can't do anything about it, and then essentially concede power and authority away to somebody that they hope can fix it on their behalf, 
The more you focus on the things that are right there in your living room that you can actually control, that you can actually have some sort of positive effect on, that's all it takes. You, you have a generation of kids, even a, a, you have a, a, a faction, a fraction of generation of kids that are, that are grown up believing that, no, this isn't the way that you do things. This isn't the way that you achieve safety or prosperity or morality or, or a just society. This isn't the way you do it. You do it this way, and then you demonstrate it, and you live it out. You can actually affect a, a, a radical change in a relatively short period of time. How do I know? Because it's what they did to us. They managed to achieve all of this without firing a shot. They simply took an inordinate amount of control over the public education system, over media, over the arts and entertainment. And the next thing you know, within three or four generations, all of a sudden, things that are that 10 years ago would have been considered absurd are now considered part of the norm. That's the part of the playbook that we should be looking at. And it really does start in the home. It really does start with, instead of millions of conservatives believing that the only way that we can affect this sort of major change is by adopting the sort of tactics that centralize power in the hands of a couple of politicians that we hope will wield it effectively and efficiently on our behalf. No, it's, it starts with, how do you raise your family? And you can affect a massive change in a relatively short period of time by just taking responsibility and ownership over that aspect of your life. It doesn't mean you ignore the other things. You don't ignore politics. Of course, you look for people that are going to fight for things that are noble, but, but that also understand that we have something to preserve. And in order to preserve it correctly, you must fight for it correctly. And that should be encouraging to us. It should be encouraging to us that we have so much more power and control over this situation if we are simply all, first and foremost, responding to what we see within our own families first. You do that, and I'm not saying that everything becomes hunky-dory overnight. It doesn't. It's going to take time just like it took time to get here. But that is where you can have the most impact. And conversely, I will say this. If you honestly believe that you're going to achieve the sort of end result that you want through the greater centralization of power in the hands of a few people that you hope will do the right thing with it, the more you spend time fighting for that, while at the same time you're dropping your kids off at institutions, which are teaching them the polar opposite, you're going to lose anyways. Again, it won't be to the woke because eventually they lose. Eventually they lose no matter what, but you're going to lose either way. And so that's what I would encourage people to do as you look at this. The, the way to fight back against the things that we don't like seeing happening on the left, the way that we don't like happening on certain elements of the right, is not to give the left the sort of reaction that it's begging for. So it can make you look either lazy, crazy, or bad. The way to do it is to recognize what's going on and then react in the way that they despise the way that they are the most afraid of. There's a reason why they cannot stand it when somebody takes their kids out of the educational institutions or environments that they have specially crafted for their quote education. There's a reason why they will mock you for that. There's a reason why they will get upset. There's a reason why in some states they will try to pass laws against it. There's a reason why they will fight against it day in and day out because they understand that more than anything else is what can blunt everything they've been working on for the past several, for the past hundred years. And, and again, I, I say that as something that I think is incredibly encouraging. And so that's where I'm going to put my focus on. I'm not going to ignore, I mean, I'm in, I'm in a state legislature. I am going to drop bills. I'm going to take votes. But you know what I also know? Democrats control the House. Democrats control the Senate. Republicans control the governor. What, what, what massive change does anyone think is honestly going to take place in the Commonwealth of Virginia over the next two years? Probably nothing. There's going to be some changes here and there. There might be some compromises in order to get a particular bill passed over here or a particular line item in the budget over here. But do you think anything massive is going to change? No. By the same token, you could take those next two years and you could really pour in to your relationship with your kids, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your friends. You could pour into any number of things that either make you more resilient, more intellectually formidable, more spiritually grounded. You could do all of those things. And in two years, you could come out of that going, you know what? No matter what happens, I'm better prepared. I have a stronger relationship with my spouse. I have a stronger relationship with my kids. All of us feel more capable for whatever comes down next. 
Or you can wake up two years from now, have a worse relationship with your spouse, worse relationship with your kids, and be horribly frustrated because lo and behold, none of the politicians were able to accomplish the things that you demanded they accomplish in a split government where it was next to impossible. Which way are you going to choose, conservative man, conservative woman? Which way? I know which way I'm going to choose. I am going to fight for those things on that political level. I am going to fight for those things on a larger cultural level. I have some means to do that by virtue of my position and by virtue of my platform. But I will tell you this much, and this is something that Tina and I have talked about a lot going into 2024, even with that position, even with that platform, the moment those things take away from my duties and responsibilities to Tina as her husband or to my children as their father, the one thing that I have become absolutely convinced of is that I will be worse with respect to my position as an elected official. I will be worse with respect to my position of having a platform if I am not first fulfilling my duty and obligation to God, to my wife, and to my children. I have to make those first because the better I do those things, the better I will be at those other things. And the way I know that is the winning strategy is because that is what frustrates the other side the most. So... I know we've talked for a long while here. Um, I wish we could have done this live. Again, I want to apologize to everyone that we're not able to do the live shows as much as we would like while I'm down here in Richmond. But I, I thank everyone for sticking with us. I think this is a really interesting conversation. And we're going we're gonna to elaborate more on this as we go. And we're gonna, we want to do kind of a brief overview on some of the things that we've seen. And we wanted to be honest with ourselves as, as conservatives, as people that uh, may be associated with with the libertarian views, conservative views are generally kind of in that on, on more the right side of the spectrum. We wanted to be honest about some of the things that we're seeing that we've, we've got to do our own house cleaning as well. Um, it, it's not good enough for us to just say, well, the problems are all out here and not pay attention to what's going on internally. And so I, I want to thank um, everyone for their input on this. I want to thank our, 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 our community within circle and, and some of the, the suggestions that they've given us on, on topics to t- discuss um, like I said, we're going to dig in more of this. Christian mentioned earlier the, the Hegelian dialectic. And sometimes when you talk about some of this stuff, it's like, what is this intellectual mumbo jumbo? And honestly, there, there's an easy way to understand some of this. And the moment I, I remember the moment I started understanding more about how this whole concept of the dialectic worked, all of a sudden, a lot of the issues that I was seeing in politics, a lot of the issues that I was seeing within the arts and entertainment industry started to make sense. And, and the reason why it's so beneficial to understand those things is because once you see how the tactic is being used, it becomes a lot easier to be able to effectively counter it, not just complain about the results of it, but effectively counter it. So we're going to dedicate some time to explaining what's going on, why, and how you effectively do that. But I can't emphasize this enough. Going into 2024, focus first and foremost on, on the, the primary duties and responsibilities within your own life because I cannot imagine a scenario I cannot imagine a scenario where doing better by your spouse, doing better by your children, doing better by your friends somehow makes you less able to do better by your country and your community. All right. I want to thank everyone for joining us. um, And thank you to Good Ranchers again for sponsoring us. Remember, go over there, goodranchers.com. Use promo code Nick. You sign up for one of the subscriptions. You're going to get like a year, every order. They're going to put in free chicken and that, and, and it is it is really good stuff. It is really good stuff. That Ben Spell likes to say, a lot of people come for the beef, but they stay for the chicken. And I'm telling you, they, they, have, a, they have a great product. So once again, thank you to Good Ranchers for sponsoring us. And a great way to support the show is to support them as well by supporting yourself with quality uh, quality products. So once again, thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you next episode.